banks right now are starting to go into critical thinking when it comes to covering their losses. And we see down the road the death of Uber, Postmates, Lyft, all these other companies, because there's so many of these cars coming to repo with so many miles, they're losing millions of, of dollars every single month. Now, Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. If you're planning on possibly purchasing or selling a car in the near future, or just curious about how the latest gyrations in the auto market are impacting your current car's wealth, you'll want to listen up to today's guest. Automotive YouTuber Lucky Lopez returns to the program to give us his latest boots on the ground reporting on the key trends driving supply, pricing, and lending in the car market right now. Lucky, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to getting back into the conversation. Thanks. Um, Lucky, it's always great when you're on the program. Um, your first appearance, uh, which was, I don't know, eight months ago or so in the program or so, um, has become Wealthion's most watched YouTube video ever. So not to, not to put any pressure on your shoulders for this discussion, <laughs> uh, but it's good to have you back. You did come back. Uh, about a month and a half ago and talked to our uh, conference goers at the the wealthy on spring conference um <clears throat> now some more time's gone on wanted to bring you back to talk to the general public about where things are headed um, in the car market they've largely been progressing along the lines that that you have been kind of you know telling us in in some of your warnings on your previous appearances on this program but um i'd, I'd love to get some updates from you before i do though just to kick this off general question for you. Um, what is your current assessment of the U.S. auto market right now? Uh, when it comes to the health of the auto market, it's actually stabilizing, which is a good thing and a bad thing. I'm seeing dealers starting to realize that cars are just simply not moving and they're getting a little bit more aggressive with pricing. I've seen inventory slowly start to fill up at franchise dealerships. The only two manufacturers that we're seeing that's not keeping up with demand is Honda and Toyota. So if anybody's watching this looking for a Toyota Sienna or a brand new truck uh, that's from Toyota or Honda, unfortunately, you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer. But one of the surprising things that I thought would probably drop about earlier this uh, or later this last year was the uh, credit news. We talked about it a little bit on your program before, but that was something that I was really worried about. Everybody got so caught up in pricing and everything else. And I told them at the end of the day, it's the banks and the credit is what's going to basically dictate how the market adjusts or crashes or quote unquote corrects. And this is one of the things I've been kind of like screaming from the hilltops for the last year and a half. And finally, it's starting to come to fruition. But um, I don't want to dive too deep into that until you until we get to that part. But that's kind of what we're seeing right now is the credit crunch has started and it's starting to affect a lot of dealers and a lot of people across the United States. Okay, and I'm I'm sure the tightening of lending standards um, that has resulted since the recent bank failures probably not helping that situation either. You're, you're smiling as I'm saying this. All right, um, we'll look, we'll get to lending in just a moment. Um, so you you sort of already touched there on supply, um, but you know the first time you're on the program, we were still kind of coming out of a lot of the the tight supplies from the missing chips and all that stuff uh, from the supply chain disruptions created by the pandemic. With the exceptions of Honda and Toyota, is it fair to say that that inventory is not that much of a problem anymore for um, most other car manufacturers? I believe so. I mean, when we first talked, I think the, the supply chains were already caught up. Like if you had a brand new Corvette, you can literally go to a Chevy dealership and order a brand new computer and it'd be in stock in a week. So I, I did this a few times on my channel to show people that there is no lag when it comes to part supplies. But a lot of manufacturers came out literally saying that why are they going to build more cars when they can keep profits higher and keep the demand low? And they're trying to keep that happy balance of not producing too many cars. Well, fast forward to today, you know, you hear people like, oh, they're not using the chip thing anymore. They're using like um, limited uh, availability. They keep saying limited availability, which means that they're just going to not make as many cars as they have. Now, there are some manufacturers that are starting to produce more to kind of eat up that market share. And some are doing really well with like Volkswagen. They're taking up a lot of like Honda, Toyota's market share. But then you have manufacturers like uh, Jeep, Chrysler and Dodge that are really getting you know uh, the, the screws put to them because if you go to any state in any town, 
you can see multiple um, dealerships with full lots of Jeep products, Dodge products, the new Rams, everything else, and they're selling below MSRP. These are one of the very few brands that I've seen that started the trend of actually giving rebates and giving people discounts on MSRP vehicles, which was the first since this whole pandemic started. Okay. And is that is that supply driven, meaning uh, their production just sort of caught up with them and all of a sudden they had many more cars than they they expected? Or is it more demand driven where just consumers just aren't showing up to buy the cars at the previous prices? I think that it's a little bit of both. Like they knew that the supply was gonna was gonna catch up, so they figured they would line their stores. A lot of my friends that run Dodge stores said that they were gonna get in certain allocations of new trucks, which would fill them up. But the demand was so high, they just figured that it would just keep going like this. But once rates got out of control and the prices just got so ridiculous, regular Americans just simply couldn't afford. You know, some of these trucks are seventy, eighty thousand dollars. That's not even the fancy ones. You can go all the way up to a hundred and something thousand dollars in some of these. Dodge Ram trucks. So the market is just simply not there. As I talk to a lot of these uh, companies, they just, they, they keep saying the same thing over and over again. They're selling out of cheap used cars, but their new cars are starting to pile up on the lot. And not only that, people are walking away from their allocations. They had a lot of these limited edition Hellcats and, and some of these Redline, uh, or excuse me, Red Eye uh, Supercharged Challengers and all this other stuff. Stuff that people are putting ten, twenty thousand dollars down for a security deposit are now coming back to these dealerships and taking it back, and because they know that why waste the money? They're just going to wait. Prices are going to come down. So instead of paying thirty, forty thousand dollars over MSRP for a truck, now they're able to get them under MSRP just by literally taking their deposits back and coming back. So this is kind of the trend that we're starting to see now. It's starting to favor the buyer instead of the seller. Okay. And that's really interesting. Um, probably music to the ears of, of folks who are watching this, given how absolutely bananas car prices went during the pandemic, right? Where you had limited availability and people were getting stimulus checks and, you know, burning a hole in their pockets and they were going out to spend them. Um, all right. I want to dig into this a little bit further, but I just want to underscore something really important that you said, um, which was that there's a pretty big difference right now between the dynamics of the, the new mar new car market and the used car market, right? Where, uh, if I understood you correctly, and this, this corroborates, um, I had a, a car dealership guy on the program two months ago or so. Um, and for folks that aren't familiar with him, uh, he is a car dealership. Uh, he owns several car dealerships, and uh, uh, you know he, he speaks out anonymously because he he doesn't want the industry and all the you know partners that he deals with in his regular day to to you know he doesn't want any retribution from speaking the truth. Um, but basically, he was saying what I believe you're saying here, Lucky, which is that we're we're seeing. Um, a very visible slowdown in in demand in new cars, or at least a willingness to pay the prices that that they were getting up until you know a year ago. Um, but we're seeing we're seeing uh, I don't want to say necessarily more demand, but strong demand in the used car market. And and let me explain why I think that's the case, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong here. But it's basically as as people are looking for more quote unquote affordable cars, there weren't all that many. In the uh, in the new car market, and uh, I, I remember car dealership guy said something like, "I can't remember the exact price," but he's like, "If you're looking to buy a car that's under like twenty, a new car that's under like twenty five thousand or thirty thousand in the U.S., I can't remember what the exact number was." At the time we were talking, he said, "There's like less than two thousand of those cars in the entire country right now, <laughs> just inventory wise." So people who are looking to buy a, a more affordable car. Are then going into the used car market, and so you kind of have an increase in demand where the supply is still, you know, fixed, and that's what's pushing up used car prices right now. Am I am I getting the story correct? No, pretty much. You you got it exactly. The the affordability just got ridiculous. Where, um, you know, like these dealers, I, I'm trying to say it nicely, but basically. They took advantage of the American consumers. They figured, okay, we're just going to rack these people for twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars of MSRP. We're going to get these people traditionally financed for eighty-four months, no big deal. Low interest rates. We'll just kick the can down the road. And I remember last time we talked on your channel, we kind of had the similar opinion that dealers were robbing their future for the next two to three years. Now mm -hmm. I said this two years ago, and everybody thought I was 
you know, losing my mind. And now I'm starting to hear this even on the news where they're like, yeah, they believe the dealers are kind of outsold themselves for the next two, three years. And it's true because when interest rates gone up now, I think uh, the average rate is anywhere from 7% uh, percent on a new car all the way up to 11% for a used car if you have good credit. So to buy something now is just is just getting tougher. And as these bank regulatory start coming in, they start now they're with all these banks collapsing, uh, financers, hedge funds, and even the government are starting to double check the criteria of what they're getting approved for. So now they're being more strict on STIPS, which is proof of income. You got to have not only your bank statements, but your W-2s, your pay stubs got to match. You got to manage your job for maybe six months instead of the three months that were before. Um, you know, full coverage insurance, they're just, they're double checking everything. And it's getting harder and harder for people to get approved. Back in the pandemic, I remember our last time, I mean, they were giving these Dodge Chargers and Challengers away $30,000 of MSRP with like $1,500 down, $1,000 down, just letting these people drive away. It blew my mind. Now, the same dealers I'm talking to, you know, they're selling under MSRP, even with four or $5,000 down, and the banks are asking for more uh, down payments. And I believe this is going to be the final push to get the car market back to normal because as this credit crunch starts to happen, dealers just simply can't afford to uh, basically finance these cars. They're going to have to either lower their prices or customers are going to have to come up with money. And unfortunately, the American public does not have any money. I know credit cards at record high, their actual uh, savings deposits, or excuse me, savings amounts are record lows in the American uh, population. So now it's they're pretty much the only thing dealers can do is lower prices or give some sort of incentives um, to actually get this done. I remember that Stellantis, Lithia, and a few other ones, I think AutoNation, they're creating their own um, captive lenders, kind of branching them out, adding more money to there. So this way they can start financing all the cars that they overpay for because Ally, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, they're not going to keep taking these massive losses at the auction. These things go to repo um, with these $30,000 deficiencies for people paying over MSRP. So now I believe that this is going to be the force that's going to correct a lot of the headaches that we see right now. Okay. Um, so lots of things wrapped up into that. So, you know, <laughs> when you look at the market today versus, you know, two years ago, two years ago, you had at least in the new car market, you had restricted supply, right, from the supply chain issues. You had a lot of demand, right? You had people that were were buying, you know, with those the hot money in their pockets. Um, and you had really loose lending standards. I mean, I remember the first time you were on this program, it really did kind of sound like if you could fog a mirror, they would find a way to get you into a car, right? Yeah. Um, now it's almost the opposite of all those factors, right? You got yeah. your tight lending standards. You got no inventory problems anymore, and the consumer is in a in a you know substantially worse place um, affordability. You know, well, well, ability to buy wise, and affordability hasn't come down that much still. So the affordability issue is is still pretty big, right? Correct. So um, you would expect in this environment that um, you know you would you would start to see an increase in defaults, which you were. Uh, you have been the last couple of times we've talked about. It. I remember you were nervous. One of the things that caught your eye was was not only were defaults on on the low end of the quality scale going up, um, but you had seen a, a doubling. Now it was from a very small percentage, but a doubling of prime borrowers defaulting. Um, ha have those trends continued since we last saw you? Yeah, they've actually gotten worse. The prime customer is, I believe, now at. 4.9%, hovering almost at 5%, which is double than, uh, than 2021 and 2022. So it's starting to get up there. Um, the one thing that's that I've seen that's really scaring me is I've talked to a number of banks um, and a lot of their, uh, how do I say it? A lot of their management is starting to figure out ways to work out some sort of programs like a forbearance. Now, a lot of these people we talked about bought these cars and literally didn't make a payment for a whole year. They called in, claimed the whole pandemic thing. Well, now they're starting to make these payments and the banks are noticing that people simply can't afford them. So a lot of the numbers that they're they're saying in the news and what Experian.com and a lot of these other companies are saying are literally, they're not correct. They're, they're backed a little bit from, I'd say they're about a year behind in data. But one thing that, that they started talking about is they're actually working out programs where they can put payments from the front of the loan to the back. So this way they can give people a fresh start so they don't have negative credit. They they can just start back over and 
So instead of repoing a car, which traditionally most banks, they just want to get their collateral and get it out of the customer's hands and sell it. They're right. taking such big losses at the auction that they decided to make up these new programs where they would add on months to the end of these auto loans and give customers a break or breathing room to get back on track. Now, this is the first time I've ever seen this done by any bank. Like they're, that's how scared they are, is they're so afraid that if they don't do this, they're going to have record high defaults. And if they do... The banks that give them the money, like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, or some of these other hedge funds, are not going to continue to give them money because their their books are going to be so in shambles because what their actual portfolio is worth to what it's actually like truly worth is going to be you know a significant number apart. And as I talk to these banks, they're really really scared. One local bank here in Nevada, they literally just hired 400 collection agents, and they're renting out one of these uh, companies that just went out of business, uh, this telemarketing company, and literally they're just going to fill a full of collection agents. They they know that the, the worst is coming. We've only seen the tip of the spear. They think it's just going to go all the way downhill. They've already started uh, collecting several investors to have money on the side so they can keep lending just in case if like Wells Fargo or Bank of America pull their lines. It's it's pretty significant. Like I said, the, the credit crunch is finally here. And before I get into that, uh, if you have any questions, I'd like to talk about how now the credit crunch is affecting the dealers as well. Go for it. I got okay. plenty of questions, but you finish. <laughs> okay. So, you know, we've been talking about, like I said, the, the credit news tightening around the consumer. They're, they're not going to have as many uh, abilities to fund. Well, little by little, Capital One, Next Gear Capital, and AFC, these are the three largest what's called flooring lines or lines of credit that us dealers use to purchase cars. Most dealers that you meet, used cars and even franchise cars, uh, don't actually own their inventory. A lot of those are purchased on credit lines. Now, traditionally, um, you know, we only try to buy a certain amount, but during the pandemic, they were giving low interest rates, they were extending payments, they were extending credit, they were just giving everybody and their grandma free lines to buy as many cars as they can, because cars, of course, Cox Automotive owns Next Gear, which owns uh, Mannheim, which owns Auto Trader, Kelly Blue Book, blah, blah, blah. So it behooves them to basically sell more cars at their auction, brings up Kelly Blue Book, brings up MMR more money for the uh, the dealerships and for them themselves. But the problem that we're having now is Capital One is pulling out of the flooring lines as well as I heard I heard rumors. I haven't I haven't seen it yet, but Ally is starting to pull out of the flooring line as well. So that's going to leave next gear and AFC, which are the two biggest ones left over. Now here's the problem with these flooring lines. They're on an adjustable rate. So just like an adjustable mortgage, stuff like that, it goes up every time the points tick up. Now, people think that dealers are getting really low prices or really low interest when it comes to these things. It's the complete opposite. We're talking anywhere three to seven points over prime is what your average flooring line is, even if you have good credit. I had a $2 million line and I was paying four points over prime. And, and this was, I think back then I was paying maybe seven to 10%. Now I'm seeing dealers paying anywhere from eight to twenty-two percent interest on their. Whoa, twenty-two percent! Hey, like, you're lucky, real quick, keep going. But just can you define what a flooring line is for viewers that aren't familiar with that term? Yeah, so a flooring line is a line of credit that dealers use to purchase cars at the auction. Also, like if you were a customer and you came in and you traded in your car, I would use that line to pay off your car with the bank. So unfortunately, a lot of dealers don't actually have money. They, they're it's all credit. They're literally shuffling around money and numbers. That's that's literally 90% of dealerships. They're operating on a shoestring budget. And this is why I believe that this is the second domino to fall with the car business. We already have the credit crunch. But as these dealers start losing their lines of credit, like they've already announced that their Capital One is pulling out. So I know a few dealers locally that have, you know, a million, two million dollars of lines of credit with these vendors. Now, just imagine you get called, hey, you have 90 days to pay off your million dollar line of credit. What are they going to do? They have to sell the cars. So that's one more thing that's hopefully it's going to push dealers to lower prices. But the the even more, I guess, insane thing that to add insult to injury is now we're at an all-time high when it comes to interest. So every new company that that basically that they have to get a new vendor line, or excuse me, um, how do I say this rightly? Now that they've lost Capital One, they have to go shop for a new flooring line, a new line of credit. And whoever's going to give them that new line of credit is going to tax the hell out of them with high interest. So now it's going to become even more un unaffordable for dealers to hold cars, which it should be. That's the way we our interest rates are so high. It's because it's incentive for us to get rid of the cars, to get them off our uh, 
our dealership lot and to sell them to consumers. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody. But I believe this is one other nudge that's going to start pushing people and getting rid of these cars. Now, the big thing that I'm really worried about is if next year and AFC start closing down a lot of independents because the franchise guys, they have tons of money. They have millions of dollars in the bank. They have backers. That's no big deal. But I honestly believe the death of the used car dealership is not too far along. A lot of my friends right now, they're overpaying for cars, trying to compete with franchise dealers, and they simply can't. When you're a franchise store, you have the ability of all this money, cheap, cheap money to borrow for your flooring lines. But then also when we sell a car, a lot of people don't know this. If you have, let's say you're a subprime borrower, the bank's going to charge me two or three thousand dollars a fee to sell you that car. So if I sell you a thirty thousand dollar car, they're going to charge me thirty five hundred dollars to do it. So your loan's still thirty five, but I'm only getting whatever twenty six fifty uh, for my actual check or twenty seven fifty. And unfortunately, franchise stores they don't have that. They can just push that deal through. On top of that, they can lend one sixty one seventy percent of LTV. Now that the credit crunch is on, a lot of us, our independent stores can only go maybe 110, 120. So we can't give you the same deals and the same rates as some of these big franchise stores. So little by little, these independent dealers are being squeezed from both ends, not only from the consumer side, but the credit side. And so I think that this is one other domino. Hopefully it's going to fall. It's going to make a lot of uh, dealers lower the prices on cars. Okay. Um, and that could be good in the near term. I am curious, though, you know, we've seen this happen in many, many other industries where the the smaller independents just increasingly get squeezed out and, and the concentration just gets bigger and bigger in the hands of the few big folks who kind of run the industry like a cartel. Yeah. What, what, what does it look like if, if there is a washout? or a die off of these uh, these more smaller and independent players here? Um, does that end up in a system that uh, offers less choice and competition and pricing benefits to the consumer? 100%. I keep telling people that competition is healthy. You want as many used car dealers in your area as possible. A lot of people I know, they, they, they hate us. They don't like us. I totally understand most uh, dealers are jerks and, and idiots, but they are a vital part of your, I guess, your, your economy. Most people don't know this, but majority of your sales tax, if you collect sales tax in your states, come from used car dealers. You can shop at the mall all day long and you're only going to get maybe $100, $200 in sales tax, where if you buy a $90,000 truck for me, we're going to whack you at 8 point, you know, what here in Vegas, 8.25% sales tax. So four or $5,000 goes straight out the door to to the government, but it helps feeds our state. So that's one thing. The second thing is we want competitive pricing. When it's small independent dealers, they're more, now I wouldn't say desperate, but they're more likely to get rid of an expensive truck on their lot compared to somebody like a big franchise store, you know, where they have the capital to sit on it and they have the capital to basically force somebody to overpay. What I mean by this is if I bought the truck for $30,000 and it's only worth 30, my bank will only give me $30,000 to lend on it, where these franchise stores can force maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 of financed amount on that $30,000 car. And they will find a bank that will push that negative equity or that bad debt into the consumer's hands and then get it off the dealer's hands so they can walk away free and clear. And this is something I keep telling people, we want to have independent dealers going around and not only independents. The one thing I'm, I'm really scared of is the death of the mom and pops franchise stores. You know, um, I'm not sure what what's what state are you guys uh, based out of or city? I, I'm in California. I'm out by about, uh, Santa Rosa is the biggest city out okay. near me. Okay, I guarantee you, if you go to your main town, you're going to see uh, some like Bob Smith's Ford that's been there for 70 years. His grandfather owned it. Now it's ran by the grandkids, blah, blah, blah. Little by little, these franchise stores are being bought up by auto groups like Auto Nation, Penske, Lithia. And little by little, they're becoming, I call them zombie entities. They're literally just eating up the market share. They don't care about building anything with the community. They're not working with anybody. Their whole goal is to basically just push out cars at a certain value amount, and then take all the fun out of it. Like, don't get me wrong, CarMax is great, but when it comes to buying a new car, a lot of these people, oh, my, my father bought from you, my, my mother bought from you, my sister bought from you, now we're coming back to buy a car from you. There was some sort of, of um, like local and social economy. Now with these big franchise stores, they're killing all of that. I've been to four auto nation stores because I've just been shopping for a car myself. And you know, I asked them, hey, the car's been on the lot for 180 days. I'll buy it for this much. 
no, we don't lower our prices. This is our price, non-negotiable. And they would not budge a single bit. It was ridiculous. I, it, and then I would tell them, I have financing, I have a check. Oh, that's fine. We still want to run your credit. We want to do this. It's you To negotiate with some of these corporate stores that are owned like that is almost impossible. So I believe we're heading towards a trend where we're going to start to see the death of a lot of these, not only small independents, but some of these locally owned, locally ran businesses and they're going to slowly start turning into these auto nations, these lithias, these sonic auto groups that are just soulless zombie uh, dealerships that are just going to kind of just, hey, here's the price. If you want it, great. If not, we have enough money. We'll sit here and wait until somebody else changes their mind. Sort of the um, Walmartification of, uh, of of car dealerships. Yeah. And and people don't think it's that bad, but just those groups alone over, oh, oh, excuse me, own over 16,000 dealerships across the United States. And it's growing every single month. They're buying not one, not two at a time. We're, they're buying handfuls at a time. So don't be surprised that little by little, you're going to see these companies take over your local area. All right. Um, okay. Uh, topic I'm sure we'll be talking about more and more uh, as you appear on this program. Um, getting back to the dynamics of what's driving, what probably most viewers care about at the end of the day, which is just, hey, what's going to happen to the price of the car I either want to buy or the car I want to sell soon? Um what I've heard you say is, is um, look, uh, con consumers are, you know, beginning to tap out on on the pricing uh, of of you know, there's a big affordability issue still in the car market. Consumers are beginning to tap out. Um, banks are really restricting their their the loans they're giving out now. Dealers are freaking out because uh, the banks don't want to get caught with holding a bunch of cars, right, that get defaulted yeah. on, that they've got a repo, right, and they don't want to be owning these fleets of, of cars, but it sounds like you think they probably are going to do that. The dealers don't want the banks to be in that situation because the banks will then start flooding the market, you know, with these cars at at, at auctions and whatnot. And then you also mentioned the number, you know, as the dealers lose their financing uh, from the banks, uh, more and more dealers are going to struggle and perhaps be in a position where they get forced to liquidate, like you said, right? Where the, their lender calls them up and says, I'm, I'm getting rid of your floor line and you get to pay me back in 90 days or whatever. So there are all these things that sound like they could be conspiring here to reduce the number of people that are showing up to buy cars anyways, but also pushing a lot of discounted inventory onto the market, even much more so than we've started to see now. So if, if I've summarized that correctly, Certainly seems like new that car prices are, are going to have a lot of downward pressure on them going forward. I'm curious, A, if that's true, and B, in the used car market, you know, as we talked about earlier, there's sort of a flood of people that that were going to buy new that are now buying used, and that's been pushing up used car prices since the start of this year. Do you see that hitting some sort of maximum at some point as you get more and more discounted inventory just sort of, you know, getting flooded everywhere? Plus, maybe we get into a recession. We haven't even talked about that uh, possibility yet. Uh, so I guess my question is, do you see this rise in used car prices as short-lived, or are there are more sort of secular things that are going to keep supporting the used car market going forward? No, I believe this was just a temporary spike. Um, from the end of 2022 till now, we've seen prices decline anywhere from 2 to 5% weekly. They were actually going down. But I knew that there was going to be a small spike during tax season. Traditionally, this is a great time for dealers to sell inventory, to, to get some big down payments because people are getting their tax returns. So that caused a temporary spike due to dealers going out to the auction. Once again, I thought that the, the economy learned, you know, it's like, what is it? It never repeats, but it rhymes. So I was mm -hmm. like, I watched dealers literally go to the auctions and overpay for cars all over again. It was like the pandemic. They, they were complaining they couldn't sell anything. Customers didn't have down payments. And as soon as they heard the word tax season, they went out and bought all this inventory to fill up their lots and thinking that tax season was going to be great, which we talked about. It's not. I was right. one of my telling people, it's not going to save the auto industry. It's going to go the exact opposite way. And unfortunately, it did. Right after that, every news outlet, people are getting you know 30% less, 50% less, 60% less on their taxes. So now dealers are stuck with these overpriced units they can't do anything of. And now that we're seeing not only dealers start to come down in price, the lending restrictions coming in, but we're starting to see customers actually starting to walk away from their cars. This is something I haven't really, I talked a little bit about in our last thing. Um, remember in the 08 recession, people started walking away from their houses because why right, are you- Jingle mail. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've actually heard, 
and I'm not even joking about this, when we were at an automotive conference here in Vegas, people are talking about doing short sales with cars. It blew my mind. I never thought in a million years I would hear people talk about this. And the first brand they bought up were Dodge. They had these crazy cars that were $30,000, $40,000 over MSRP. They had a few companies in there that were financing strictly Hyundais. And I don't know if you know what the Palisade and Telluride are, very popular SUVs with Kia and Hyundai. They were selling them for $30,000 over MSRP. Wow. Now you can buy a brand new one under MSRP at certain dealerships. So imagine going to a dealership to service your car. And, you know, most Americans, every two to three years, they purchase a vehicle. So imagine coming in, you bought your car in, let's say, 2020. Here we are, 2023, you're ready to trade it in. Your car's got 30,000 miles. The car is worth 60. You paid 90 because you're an idiot. You paid $30,000 over MSRP. Now you're going in, they're telling you your car is worth 40, but you're 30 or $40,000 upside down in negative equity. So they're actually starting to see more and more of these people literally going out, buying another car. And then as soon as they get that other car on their credit, they just let the other one go. Because why are you going to pay $80,000 for a car that you can literally go to the dealership brand new and buy it for 60 k And I believe we're going to start to see this trend more often. Um, and now banks are starting to worry about this. So the whole jingle mail thing of coming back I believe we're not that far away. So that's another reason why I believe that the market is going to, something's got to give. Either they keep lowering prices, the the, the interest rates are going to get higher, or these banks have to do something creative to offset their risk. Now, I really want the banks to just repo the cars and get them back there and take a loss. But right now, banks banks will not take a loss unless they absolutely have to. So right now, they're going to cry and scream that it's so bad, praying to God that the government's going to jump in and come in. But we talked about last time on your program, you do not want the government to jump in because once they do, they're going to start regulating auto loans and everybody that we know can't afford their cars, whether due to income, debt to income ratio, whatever it is. So I'm praying to God that these banks just take it into shorts. They learn their lesson. Don't over lend. Let the market correct itself because even a lot of the, the, the one of the videos that popped up on my YouTube channel, what we still talked about, I think how we met is, you know, we go to the auctions all the time. There's thousands I'm not joking, thousands of cars all across pretty much every major city sitting in holding lots. And when they are when they repo these cars, they don't flood the floors because they know they'll drop the market. They take a handful, they run them at the auction. They take another handful, they run them at the auction. For them, it's better to offset the depreciation of the car with running them at the auction slowly than dumping them all at once. And so banks are starting to learn this. The repo companies that I know, they're buying acres and acres of storage lots just for this thing because they believe it's another 2008, 2009 recession where they're going to have all these people walking away from their cars. Now, this is only the auto loan stuff that are public information you can tell. Buy here, pay here lots are literally people are just throwing their keys, walking away. I work with a lot of payday loan companies here in Vegas and title loan companies. Record amounts of defaults. They've never seen it this high. It's almost triple what they normally see. Wow. People, okay. They can't they can't afford it. They're just, they bought these cars cash and we're talking like new cars. I, I just picked up a 2022 Mazda uh, 6, only had like 10,000 miles. They paid cash for it during the pandemic. But then, you know, as a few months went around, the money, all the stimulus went away. They had to go get a title loan on the car for $10,000 at, God, I don't even know what it is, like 200 something percent interest, but they're paying like $700 a month for this car. They simply can't afford and they don't qualify for traditional financing. So these people are taking these cars to the pay the loan stores to try to get some money out of them. And it's just, it's just bad, bad, bad. So everything culminating just seems like there's enough downward pressure on the market to lower car prices in the future. But for some reason, I feel like there's always some sort of event that props up the market and keeps it from falling. I literally thought last year was the end of it and we'd see a steady decline like rapidly, but now it just feels like it's a slow, steady correction. Yeah. And I remember, you know, when we talked uh, the first time you had thought that Q2 2023 was going to be like the right time to buy a car, you get, get the best deals. It seems like that's been pushed out for a lot of the reasons that you, you've mentioned here. Um, and I'm guessing, as you said, you, you see it less now that there's going to be a capitulation in the moment in the market and prices all of a sudden just drop hard. It sounds like you're seeing it more of just sort of a slow grind downwards. Is that true? Correct. Yeah. So um, let me ask you this in terms of what you think should happen. And, you know, we'll, we'll have you back on the program again and again, lucky to give us updates so you can tell us what actually is happening along the way. But in terms of what you think should happen, you know, if somebody is in the market for, let's say, buying a car at some point in the next year, um, 
where, where do you think prices should go down to based upon all the major issues we've been talking about here? Well, the good news is, is I believe that uh, consumers will get better pricing, but the downfall is, is the financing part is probably going to be the biggest hiccup. So even though you save five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, if interest rates go up another two to 3%, you're still going to pay that on the back end. So the affordability problem is still there. I think that now that more manufacturers are actually starting to offer rebates and kind of give some of these cars away, I think that's a great incentive. I do see people towards the end of the year getting a much better deal because as these banks start to really tighten down on that lending, all these captive banks that these manufacturers have, like Toyota Financial, GM Financial, stuff like that, they're going to be so desperate to move cars that I believe not only are they going to give you cars at or under MSRP, but they're probably going to give you low single digit interest to, to capture that business, to get that car off their dealership's floor. And we're almost going to get back to where we were in 2019. Now, people thought we're nuts for saying this. There's no way it's going to happen. But you can literally, I'm not even joking, you can drive by any Dodge Jeep dealership. They're full of cars. I've seen Nissans piling up. Mazda. Mazda just came out of the blue, uh, the woodworks. Actually, the third of those cars you talked about, the 2000 cars mm -hmm. that are under 25K, the third of them are all Mazdas. Mazda has the cheapest affordable economy car, the Mazda 2 uh, hatchback. Um, I mean, it's a nice little car for the money, and it's the only thing you can buy that's 25 grand. Whoever thought that you can't even buy anything? Like, I went to go look at motorcycles the other day. I knew motorcycles $25,000. So it's it blows my mind. So as we move forward in this economy, I think that's the only way you're going to get a deal is, one, to buy a new car, which is, seems ridiculous, and two, to get a captive lender that'll give you um, special financing, hopefully single digit interest and give you 72 and just don't do 84 months. I know a lot of people are doing this just to afford the payment, but stay away from that. So I'd say hopefully at the end of this year, um, even myself, that's what I'm looking to buy as well. Um, that's probably what we're going to be going into. Okay. Uh, from a, from an MSRP standpoint, just putting the financing element aside for a second, and, and, and I'm just asking you to prognosticate here. No one's going to hold you to this, but Percentage wise, what do you think? How much better a deal could you get then end of the year versus now if things go the way that you think they, they should? Ten percent, twenty percent more or less? I, I think it's going to be a higher percentage rate. Um, I'd say probably twenty percent. The reason is is you know we kind of touched on this back in the day. I remember when the 08 recession happened, nobody wanted to talk about it. Everything was fine, but once I heard on the news that people started talking about recession, they publicly announced it. Then I watched everything drop. We're kind of here already. Last two months, they're talking about recession. I heard them use the auto crisis, which is hilarious. Makes me laugh. Um, so <laughs> I'm, starting to, I'm starting to hear this stuff and I'm starting to see the trend. And you'll see dealers all across the United States starting to walk back their prices. Now, there are a lot of dealerships that are holding over MSRP. Now, if you're trying to buy a Corvette or something like that, something where they know that it's going to be a more financially secured uh, customer, they're not going to give you a discount. They're going to try to still sell it above MSRP until enough people walk away. But if you're looking for a regular car, nothing that's a rare oddball model, you should be able to get a great deal. And one thing I also want to tell your viewers and people that are car shopping is don't be afraid to call multiple dealers. I, I don't understand the mentality of, of the shopper, but when I'm looking for a deal, I call multiple dealers in multiple states. I throw dozens of offers, you know, the worst they could tell you is no. I've seen people literally like go to one dealership and like in California, hey, this dealership in Riverside, they, they don't want to give me a deal on my truck. They want $10,000 of MSRP. Okay, well, why don't you go to, uh, you know, San Diego, there's one right there that you can get at MSRP, save 10 grand. They won't drive or, or fly two, 300 miles to go get a deal to save $10,000. It blows my mind. So I tell people now, start calling multiple states, different things. If you're looking for a convertible, not even going to lie, call the East Coast in the wintertime. If you're looking for a 4 by 4 truck, try to do something here in the desert or somewhere in the uh, that's not really, that doesn't have snow and everything else. Think kind of outside the box and look for the better deals because I promise you, a lot of these franchise dealers are so worried about the future that they're pushing out these inventory to keep their allocations coming in because... We've heard whispers of manufacturers like Ford, Honda, Chevy, Toyota are going to punish dealers for selling over MSRP. They're going to take their allocations away, which is how many cars they're allowed to get. So if this truly comes to fruition, a lot of these dealers that have been screwing the consumers 
are really going to reap what they sow. They're not going to get as many units as they traditionally would. And all the dealers that decided to sell under MSRP to give customers a good deal are going to reap the benefits and they're going to get more allocations for more affordable cars. And it's going to kind of balance the scales again. So Wow. So there's going to be pressure from the manufacturers on the dealers to actually sell below MSRP. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Different world. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying if, to be sort of a savvy buyer, and a lot of this just makes common sense, but is, is you know, talk to multiple uh, dealerships. And it sounds like you're saying, you know, obviously do your homework, but but call, it sounds like I think I heard you say, kind of like call with an offer, right? Like, hey, I'm looking for this car. Here's what I'm willing to pay. Willing to take it? Yes or no? Let me know. Um, and it sounds like you're saying the trend is your friend here, where increasingly more and more of these dealers are going to be coming under pressure just to move the product, right? And um, uh, this is similar to, you know, frequent Wealthion viewers will know Lance Roberts uh, is one of Wealthion's endorsed financial advisors. <clears throat> he sold his house about eight months ago or so in anticipation of lower uh, housing prices. He lives in Houston, Texas, <clears throat> and uh, he has been <clears throat> spending, <clears throat> excuse me, he's been spending the time since um, basically doing what you've just said. He's, he's got his target area and he's been finding homes that he you know is willing to buy, but he's putting in, uh, I don't want to say lowball offers, but, 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 you know, market uh, correct offers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Correct offers. And, and, and they look lowball to, to, you know, people that have been looking at yesterday's prices or, or even some of today's existing prices, but all he needed was one to say, yep, I'll take it. And he, he got a seller that finally said, yep, I'll take it. You know, given my personal situation, I just need to move the house. So he succeeded exactly using the strategy that you're talking about here. Um, all right. So uh, one thing that I'm really curious about is, uh, you know, you said Mazdas were the majority of those, the, the few thousand cars that were available new under 25,000. Um, you know, it it kind of blew my mind, and I think many people's minds a few years ago when, when Ford came out and said, you know, we're not making cars anymore, right? We're just we're just all trucks and SUVs from now on. It's kind of crazy yeah. to think that Ford doesn't actually make sedans anymore. So as people are looking for more affordable cars to drive, um, you know, de facto trucks and SUVs are more expensive than a traditional economy sedan then you kind of have to, you do have to go into the used car market, right? So you you, you have a, um, you have a dwindling supply, I guess is what I'm saying, of of economic cars. And right now people are competing for them and, and they're competing for an aging fleet of used sedans. I'm curious, do, do you see at some point here, the manufacturers ever going back to manufacturing more sedan model, more economically affordable cars? Or is this a new world where they're really just trying to go for the new unit they can sell for the most price? Yeah, I, I hate to say it. It's all about profit and all about stock prices. They they gross far more in SUVs and trucks and they could sell them for a much higher price because it, it, what they cost them to build a Ford Focus is the same price what it costs them to build a Ford Escape, but they can sell a Ford Escape for you know eight to twelve thousand dollars more than a Ford Focus. So why would they waste their time? And you know Ford dropped this news about three four years ago, saying that they were going to start walking away from the economy section, and that's why I believe like companies like uh, Mazda, especially Hyundai and Kia, I believe they're going to eat up a probably about seventy percent of that market share. But it's very interesting because I thought all like Honda, Toyota, everybody would jump into this bandwagon and try to eat up that market share that Ford's leaving there. But Honda and Toyota are kind of going with this thing. Well, why are we going to make more cars when we can make more profits? So we're going to keep demand low. I mean, keep demand high, keep supply low and keep our profits extremely high. But now people like Mazda are trying to ramp up production. You have people like Volkswagen that are coming out with all kinds of new electric models. Volkswagen's going to have, I think, by... 2025, they're going to have 14 different electric models, not even wow. including gas, 14 electric models across the United States and the world that they're going to have available, which is absolutely insane. So all these companies, I believe, are going to start eating up this market share. I want to see how fast Honda and Toyota pivot and start making cars again. So it's one of those things like, you know, they want to keep profits high, but eventually if you lose so much market share, you know, they're going to have to do something. And unfortunately, I think that's what we're waiting for to happen is, just like uh, I think Ford, Chevy, all these manufacturers, everybody's the same thing. We're not going to build as much. They're trying to do a build to direct model, which I think will fail. Where like a Tesla, like if you order a Tesla, they build it. If you don't order a Tesla, they don't build as more. 
our business always ran with supply. You got to force people in there, get them to buy a car they mm -hmm. can't afford it or they they want, they get excited for. We're, you know, what is it? Uh, a consumer-based uh, economy. So if we can't get them to purchase this stuff and it's not sitting on the showroom floor, I think that sales are going to drop tremendously. So it's very interesting to see what's going to happen in the next three to five years in the car business. Okay. Um, well, looking forward to having you coming back on frequently to update us uh, on us all as it happens. Um, all right. So it, I intuited from your feedback here that uh, if somebody is in the market for a car right now, um, that they should they should take their time, meaning patience is on their side here, uh, and then employ the strategies we talked about earlier, where we're letting competition and the increased motivation of the dealers to move product work in their favor. If you're somebody who's been sort of thinking about selling a car, um, not necessarily a trade-in, because then you have to think about buying at the same time, but let's just say you have an extra car you're thinking about, you know, eventually selling, I I'm guessing you would say probably sooner the better. Is that true? Yeah, as as values are still high, I would do it. I mean, they are dropping two to three percent. You're not going to notice it tremendously, but if you wait, just like I did, I waited six months on my R8 and I lost forty thousand dollars in value on my car. Whoa. That's on a two hundred thousand dollar car. So when you when you start looking at some of these smaller cars, people are like, oh, it only dropped four or five hundred bucks, but every month it starts dropping four or five hundred dollars. In six months, it's going to look pretty ugly. So that's why I would get rid of what you have now, and especially if you're a consumer that's got a twenty two or twenty five percent interest rate, you need to refinance now because your vehicle value is still somewhat high. If you try to refinance in a year from now, guess what's going to happen? Your vehicle value is going to be below what it's actually what you owe on it and no bank is going to refinance you. and you're going to be stuck with high interest and a lot of negative debt so try to refinance that get lower interest and then on top of that pay your still your same car payment so you can bring that deficit down to what you actually owe what the value is so i think that's the next fall off that's happening because we see a lot of people with 22 percent interest loans they can't refinance it because they owe more than what the car is worth because right. they put zero down so God, that just hurts my head to hear 22 percent <laughs> <I know. laughs> interest charge on a loan. Um, all right. Uh, well, look, Lucky, this has been wonderful. Before I ask you where folks can go to learn more about you and follow your work, um, is there anything else we haven't talked about yet that you think is worth just putting in people's minds before we wrap things up here? Um, I mean, I think you hit a nail on the head with just being patient and making offers. And one thing that I kind of do is if you go to Car Gurus, you can actually sort cars by how long they've been on the platform. So the oldest car there, don't look at the prices, look on what car is the oldest and make your offer. Because more than likely, if the car has been sitting there for 100 days, 200 days, you're going to get a deal. But if you're trying to make a low ball offer on a car that's been there for seven days, it's not going to happen. So I would definitely look at time on market. That's what us dealers really worry about because the more the longer it sits there the more interest i pay the more fees i pay with my credit lines my flooring lines so it benefits them to get it off so don't be afraid to shoot those really great offers on cars that have been sitting on lots substantially longer and try to get pre-approved first before going uh to the actual uh, dealership because some way or another they're going to try to add something on there so i would just watch out for that all right. Lucky. Love the practical advice. Uh, thanks so much for sharing all your expertise with our viewers here. Before I forget, there's something I definitely want to bring up for, for you and your watchers and your viewers is banks right now are starting to go into critical thinking when it comes to covering their losses. And we see down the road the death of Uber, Postmates, Lyft, all these other companies, because there's so many of these cars coming to repo with so many miles, they're losing millions of, of dollars every single month. Now, this is something that I've been dealing with for the last five years. Usually when we do an auto loan, the first thing the banks ask me is, are they doing any type of ride share, delivery service, or anything like that? And usually we say no. And as long as their income doesn't say Lyft or Uber or Postmates, they go ahead and let it through. Well, now they're having so many losses because there's so many cars that are two, three years old with 100,000 miles on there. So people are just racking up these miles, collecting all the money from Uber and Lyft and, and putting their car on Turo, just beating the hell out of it. And then once basically they try to trade it in, they're upside down in their car, they're just walking away. Now, traditionally, if you use a car for commercial purposes, they will give you a shorter term, 48 to 60 months, and it'll be higher interest, 10 to 12%. 
That's to incentivize you to pay down the car faster to offset the risk of adding miles, beating it up and stuff like that. But people are not doing that. They're going out buying these cars with zero down, 84 months at, you know, whatever back then at 4% interest. And they were just juicing these, uh, these cars. And now it's getting to the point where banks are trying to put in their new writing where if you buy a new car and they catch you using it for Uber, Lyft, Postmates, or Turo, they have the right to take your car back from you, which I wow. think is going to be huge. And so people, people are like, oh, they can't do that. Yes, they can. They can protect their collateral. It's just like if you don't have insurance on the car, they can charge you an additional fee. Now, banks are going to do two things. They're either going to charge you an additional uh, uh, insurance fee or a binder to cover the risk for you using it as a rental car, or they're just going to totally take your car away. I know several leasing companies actually are doing that right now. Um, there's uh, luxury leasing partners that if they find out you're doing any type of rental, ride share, anything else, they they just take your car from you. Um, I know BMW Financial is starting to put those things in place because they were financing a lot of these Rolls Royce Ghosts, Phantoms, Wraiths, and people are using these things on Turo rental cars and just beating the hell out of them, putting them thousands of miles on them, and just giving them back. And you know they're eating a hundred thousand dollars in deficiency from the negative equity, the miles they put on it and just beating the car up. And so I believe all these things are going to come to an end. And this is something that's very big because I know we haven't talked about it, but this is just one more small thing that's going to start affecting the economy because now you have less people out there doing Uber, doing Lyft. So there's more unemployed people. And as this starts to roll into like the tech sector, now we're talking even more layoffs. Once Uber starts losing drivers, they're going to lay off more people, Postmates. A lot of people don't know this, but Amazon hires a lot of third-party independent uh, companies to do deliveries as well. So this is going to trickle into the economic sector where it's just going to have more people losing their jobs, losing their money, and it's just going to spell doom and gloom for the car business. Super interesting. I hadn't even thought about that, that knock-on effect of what would happen to the industries that are dependent upon, you know, independent, um, you know, ride share or people that are providing basically their own vehicles. Um, and of course, it makes a ton of sense. Like if you're a bank, you don't want to get stiffed with a with a, a car where the guy just basically sort of jingle mails the car back to you and you've got a car that's only a couple years old, but it has a tremendous amount of mileage on it, right? So it's much harder to sell versus other cars of the same model and make and age that weren't beat on like that. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that people need to listen to this. If you hear this, you need to call your bank, let them know. If you have to pay additional fees, do it, refinance it, get it out of that bank's name, find a bank that actually will be okay with you doing that. You may get a shorter term, you'll get higher interest. And also something they need to know about, you need to tell your insurance company. There are so many people driving people on Uber and Lyft that don't have the correct insurance. If they get hit, somebody gets sued, injured, it's just going to be bad. So the auto market, like I said, it just it has so many problems going on right now. I'm still shocked that like half the the the, the economy of the automotive industry is functioning. But I feel like something is going to happen that's going to really change the market. For folks that have really enjoyed this conversation and would like to learn more about you, follow you and your work, where should they go? Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Lucky Lopez, also on YouTube as well as Lucky Lopez. And it'd be a huge favor if you guys learned from this video and you enjoy uh, me and Adam's conversation, please comment below. It means a lot. I actually read every single comment and I know Adam does too. And so I want to see if we can beat our last video. So I know interaction is probably one of the biggest things that people want. So I'll try to answer as many questions in the comment section below if that's okay, Adam. That's wonderful. I really appreciate that. Folks are going to love it. Uh, I also love the competitive nature to beat out the previous video too, Lucky. So that's great. Um, all right, Lucky. Well, look, thanks so much, buddy. Uh, this has been wonderful. Like I said, doors always open here for you to come update us when you see something going on in the market that you think is notable. Um, really appreciate it, folks. Uh, if you did, please comment below, like Lucky said, and do us a favor, support this video and this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Lucky, can't thank you enough, buddy. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.